Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. Good afternoon. Uh, it is uh, it's time for Painting of the Week. So uh, relax. For those of you out jogging, don't relax. Just speed up. Oh, yeah. Uh, for those of you trying to get to sleep, you're going to have to wait 40 minutes because this is going to be really interesting. <laughs> those of you cooking, good luck. And uh, so I'm Phil. And I'm Laura. And today we're talking about one of my favourite paintings. I, If I owned this painting, I would have an entire room just for this painting and a seat to look at it. That's, that's so lovely to hear that. What, have you got any reason why it's your favourite painting? I just, I just absolutely love it. That's so funny. Of all the paintings you know. Yeah. I just think it's absolutely brilliant oh. and lovely in so many different ways. And it, it, the storytelling is great. And it, anyway, so much to this painting. Um, oh, good, because I can sit back and relax then. I'll start uh, cooking. We've, um, <laughs> one of the very first uh, exhibition on screens, well, in fact, this, was it the second one? We, anyway, in the, se- in the first season was a film about Manet. And I remember going to the, to the very spot where he painted this, and um, I, got, I got I really got enthralled by this painting. And trying to anyway, we can, we'll talk about it. So you know this painting? I do know the painting. Yeah, hey. I don't know whether I would have. I always think it's really hard to say something's your favourite. Is always tricky. Yeah, because it depends on what mood you're in. Yeah, and, true. But true. with all the paintings that you know. I didn't expect you to say that today. I wasn't ready for you to say that. So yeah, I'm quite. I was quite intrigued when you said that. Well, you know, yeah. there, there are lots of paintings I'd very happily have on my wall, but I just <laughs> I don't know. There is something about this. Um, but you've just been to Washington. So I have just been to Washington, mm. working on a couple of films, uh, and doing a screening of Raphael Revealed. Mm. Um. And I went to the National Gallery of Art because I had a meeting there with a curator to talk about a film that my colleague is doing about an artist called Mary Cassatt. Okay. Anyway, whilst I was at the National Gallery, of course, I had a little wander around and I did go and have a look at this one as always. So we're talking about the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., one of the world's great galleries if you're in Washington, D.C., you have to go and just wander through it. Yeah. I haven't been. So they, that's another one for the list, Phil. They have. I mean, it's just masterpiece after masterpiece. Mm, and it's a beautiful space. Mm. One, of the, one of the great things about the... Well, one of the advantages that the United States has is that it's so big. Mm. They have so much land. Yeah. That these galleries that were built were, they weren't squashed in anywhere. They were, they, you know... Yeah. That row of galleries and museums in Washington, D.C., air and space and African, American art, and, and um, I mean, they're huge. And the National Gallery of Art is, is just massive and it's just beautiful and the paintings are beautifully laid out. Mm. Um, and this is where Edouard Manet's The Railway ended up, um, what, 150 years after its conception. Well, I hope it's in a room on its own. It's got its own seat. Uh, well, no, it's <laughs> not, I have to say. Okay. So, mm. what do we see? <laughs> what do you see, Laura? Um, well, see, yeah, instantly I'm drawn to this lovely lady looking at us. And uh, because I really loved her face and her expression. Um, but and then I didn't, and it took me a while to notice the puppy, yeah, which I was surprised about because I think most people may have noticed the puppy before. It took me a while to get to that. And then I, I just was like, okay, this is a lovely painting. You've done a little competition. and then, So I was looking around for the part of the painting that you'd put onto uh, to the Facebook. And then I said, well, what they must have been doing? They must have been reading a book then, I'm assuming, together because I'm intrigued about those grapes. Were they eating the grapes? Okay. Where did the grapes come in? <laughs> so 
So all I did was end up with more questions, as always, than answers. I'm looking forward to today, cup of coffee, and Phil's going to fill me in. <laughs> well. <laughs> yes. When I first saw this painting, uh, I assumed, I made the assumption that they were on the street. Because that is the assumption you'd make, isn't it? Yeah. They're there, what, they're, they've just sat down on a street. Yes. And I think you, I think you can tell from the from the steam, and if you look far right, you know that looks. You start to put it together. That's part of a railway where the light, you know, the, the lights would be. And you look down, and you can see a little hut down there, maybe a man in blue. And so you get the idea that looks that the look the girl is enthralled by a steam train that's just gone past. Yes. So I always thought they're on one of the boulevards or one of the rue. And they've just stopped, and the, the little girl is so enthralled by the trains that she's just looking at the trains. And the other woman, uh, who I've always, I thought to myself, probably a little young to be her mother, so it's probably in a maid, you know, a nurse, oh, a nurse, okay. uh, maybe even an older sister. Mm. But they're out together. She's got a little book in her pocket and a little puppy and. So she's just happily reading a book. Puppy's asleep <laughs> while the girl looks at the trains. It's a perfect scene. And yes, bottom right, there's some grapes there, which maybe they've actually deliberately come to this spot and it's almost like a mini picnic. Yeah. But so we went and we filmed. And if you watch um, Manet, the exhibition on screen film, you'll see a lovely tracking shot where we go along what looks like exactly this spot with railings just like this uh -huh. and buildings in the background that look just like those buildings top left. Uh, but then I did a bit more research. Okay. Into where exactly this painting was done. And actually what I discovered was that I was 180 degrees out. So where, if you look top of her, of her head, where the brown doors are. Yes. That essentially is where I filmed the railings, looking this way. Oh, okay. And in fact, mm. this was painted in somebody's garden. Oh. That the bottom of the garden had these really quite ornate railings to the bottom of a garden. That's I still find that slightly confusing. Yeah. But the bottom of the garden were these railings, and actually, the city in the in the garden. It transpires of a friend of Manet's uh, looking out onto the railway. Now, which starts to make a bit more sense because that's quite a lot for a nursemaid to carry. Yes. A bunch, bunch of grapes, <laughs> holding, on, holding the little girl's hand, yeah. carrying a book and a puppy. Yes. And then the puppy's asleep. So if, yeah. so if they've just sat down, the puppy would still be restless. So, that, you know, it suggests that they've been there a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. And, there's, you know, the little girl... It doesn't necessarily look a tremendously sunny day, the way he's painted it, but she's not got anything on her shoulders. Oh, so no. so actually, sense. it starts yeah. to make a bit more sense that they're just at the bottom of a garden. Now, maybe it doesn't matter, but this is where, I don't know, I, I quite like to be informed by the history of the artist. I think Manet is an absolute genius. He, his paintings are just fantastic. <laughs> and an absolute, I talk about this quite a lot, but an absolute example of really high creative achievement that we as humans are capable of. Okay. And there's many wonderful paintings. Now, broadly speaking, a lot of people just, you know, just lump him in with the Impressionists. Yeah. Um, and as we've talked before in other podcasts, you've got to be very careful about that. These people that we think of as this group, the Impressionists, are all actually very different. Yeah. And although Manet and Monet have almost the same name, which mm -hmm. is confusing, mm -hmm. very different personalities, yes. very different painters. And then you, Renoir, Degas, Cezanne, they're all very different. Manet never exhibited with the Impressionists. Oh. If I'm right, they had eight shows. Okay. And he never exhibited in any of them. Okay. Whereas oh, I didn't know that. Um, Pissarro, mm. and we've got a very good film about Pissarro um, coming up, he exhibited in all of them. Okay. Actually, yeah, yeah. I've written it down, the names of the artists. that 
I hadn't noticed that I'd missed out Man A. <laughs> yeah, well, from the show. I've actually written it down. <laughs> The ones that were in <laughs> the good. impression is exhibition, and I didn't notice that I'd actually risked him out. Yes, yeah, so the eighteen seventy four. Things are going show. really well, Phil. <laughs> That's very good. So eighteen seventy four, which is the day, the year after this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> got Monet, Renoir, Cezanne, Pissarro, Sisley, mm. Degas, and Morisot. Mm. And I hadn't, re- I hadn't realised. <laughs> well, he's he's interesting, man. He just, I mean, one of the things about impressionism, which is it's kind of slightly quirky to know, is that they 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 said we we can't use black, right? Yeah. Because the, the let's call it a color, the color black. Mm. And Manet wasn't having that at all. He loved black. So you look at this painting. You look at her, look at her hat. It, yeah. Look at the railings. Yeah. He was extremely influenced by um, Spanish art, so Goya and Velázquez, um, and uh, El Greco were really influential on him. And you see him actually. Directly copying some of their works, but definitely the deep blacks. Um, well, maybe that's why he put that, the black on that hat. Then maybe he got upset that he was. He, he, I mean, you know, he wasn't having that. Um, but he was but, really good friends, though, wasn't he, with Morisso? Yeah, so he, so, so but, he must have been really upset then. That she's got in. No, no, no. He, 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 no, he mixed with the group. He, okay. Oh no, they're all mixed, and there's a. And they were okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so they were really good friends, weren't they? We talked so about his, that his, So Manet's brother Maris is, marries Bert Morisot, mm. and there is rumours that maybe he'd have had some kind of fling with Morisot before mm. they got married. I don't mm. know. Um, but he's mm-hmm. he's definitely part of the group, and and actually the other artists really looked up to him. Now, there's an inter- I mean, it's an important part of history, but at this point, you have the Salon, the annual show. So if you think the Royal Academy yeah. summer show, mm. it's a similar kind of thing, only actually more important. This was the gateway to commissions. So you were desperate to have your paintings in the Salon, mm. which was in a building um, you know, by, by the Seine, and the paintings would be hung floor to ceiling. If I'm not mis- was it in alphabetical order, anyway, basically they were just fitted in, yeah, whatever they could could be. And there's, there's great stories of artists going down, like I think it happened to Manet. He went down and he was really upset to see his painting like at the top of the wall. Oh but, yeah, I can imagine. Um, but then artists started to get irritated because they weren't being accepted into the salon. Mm-hmm. So then they had something called the Salon des Refusés, which is the Salon of the Refused. They hired a hall which no longer exists, also by the Seine. Lots and lots and lots of paintings were painted there. All the people that had been turned down by the Salon. And actually it was extremely popular and it caused, it caused a real fuss. Well, I can imagine. But getting into the Salon was a real ambition. And so even in this year, unless I'm mistaken, he submitted four and only two were accepted, but I believe this was accepted, even though people criticised it, as they often criticised the Impressionists, as being unfinished. So if you compare this to, a, you know, what the conservative art world were looking for, which was very polished, very finished, almost quasi-realistic, this is clearly not that. This is, I mean, look at that dress. All right, it reads to us very easily as a dress, but you compare that to some of the works in the decades and centuries before where, okay, it's quite a leap to go all the way back to somebody like, um, I don't know, Titian or Velázquez or someone. Yeah. But you imagine how much time and effort they put into creating a dress which feels almost like you could just jump out of the, of the painting. Well, this is actually just strokes. Yes. And that whole idea of just capturing a moment, capturing a, you know, a fleeting moment. Did he spend a lot of time on these paintings or were they a little bit less? Um, I mean, because those are the ones you're talking about. Manet, they, they spent years, like some of them spent like years and months on those ones. Well, So maybe I mean, he just didn't feel that it warranted the time. I mean, Vermeer, famously, mm. there's only 35 paintings that still exist, which yeah. is certainly suggestive of somebody taking a long time mm. to, to do a painting. Yeah. Manet, there's hundreds. Um, right. But um, he did take, I mean, actually, if you look at this, I mean, there's a lot going on here. But what I like about it is, although he's, ca- although he's capturing a fleeting moment, 
There's an awful lot of energy going on. Yeah. Now, the use of those vertical uprights is is quite deliberate. And on the one hand, it divides the planes. It divides the two characters and their world from the world behind it. The world behind it is a very, very rapidly changing world. So old Paris and by inference old France and by inference old Europe is changing very quickly and it's modernizing. And you have whole kind of slums or very medieval lanes and, and uh, you know, the old Paris is being torn down and these wide new boulevards are being created with those, what we now think of Paris was basically only created 150 years ago. Right, yeah. And so there's an enormous amount of building going on. And for some, that was very troubling. Um, but, it, you know, Paris is modernising. Part of that modernisation are the railways. Uh -huh. And the railways change everything. So, again, trying to understand the history of the Impressionists, well, the fact they can go out to all these places along the Seine, they're, getting on, they're jumping on the train. Yes, yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, you're starting to get commuters, you're able to travel to Dieppe and catch the ferry to England if you want to very quickly. I mean, obviously train, cha trains change everything. Now, behind this garden, which may have gone a little bit further back before, or it may be one of the new buildings, it looks like actually it's a new building, but that railroad has just gone straight through whatever was there before. <laughs> Yeah. So there's a real sense here of, you know, she is is she's representing a France which is changing. Right, yeah. And the young girl is actually it's a bit similar to the film I just made about Afghanistan, where by choosing a young boy, it projects your mind forwards. What's going to happen? So you have the maid, the uh, you know, the 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 nurse, not the nurse, the um they call nanny yeah, or the nanny maybe not yeah no, no, the <laughs> nanny, nanny, yeah. <laughs> the nanny <laughs> representing you know a certain type of life yeah um maybe from the 1820s 1830s and but the world's changing around her you have the young girl looking at this new world looking at the steam train and you know what kind of world is she growing up in mm. um those railings not only are they dividing us from the world behind, but also there's a punctuation to them, which they often do. You'll see this in other Manet works we've got where it's done with trees. Uh -huh. And it's like, it's just, it's just punctuating, dang, 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 dang. So it's, al it's almost possibly suggesting the, the sound of the train, but it's certainly a sense of, of moving, moving left to right. Um, Black and white, so the black railings with the white smoke behind. Again, you're kind of drawn back to the railings, into the smoke, back to the... It's all very clever. And then behind the railings, it's just little bits, but it's just enough to tell you that you're looking down at a railway and there's, there's the guy down there on the tracks and that's a little signalling hut. And yeah. um, maybe, you, you know, is that just the edge of the train at the left-hand side? Exactly. And, is it, do you uh, think? I don't, know. I don't know what it is, actually. It's funny that there is literally, I mean, no, you can't see any train really, can you? Don't think so. I mean, I'm not that, the left-hand side, mm. right by the edge, where it's yeah. kind of smudge of brown and green, not really sure what that's supposed to be. I mean, it could be anything. It could be even, uh, you know, one of those water dispensers that trains yeah. sometimes have to stop by. I There's don't not know. even a hint of where the tracks are. Ooh, well, I think maybe. there is actually. Oh, yeah, right hand. Yeah, I think, oh, so, I yes, think these are right. tracks. Okay, I've got it now. And, I mean, the stations, you know, if you go and stand there now, you can see the state. This is right by um, what was actually uh, um, a pretty new station. I mean, uh, Austerlitz, mm. I think. Um, it's right by it. And, uh, and then, and then the, the, even the... You know, the softness of the puppy. I just think these all things are all very deliberate. You've got the slight metallic harshness of the railings and the sense of a railroad and it's metal and it's noisy and it's steam and it's coal. If you go in really close on that puppy, it's just all oh it's mm. so soft and so, mm. you know. Yes. There's nothing oh. metallic or harsh or 
edged about it at all. Um, she got a fan as well. She got a fan. Now she was a model that he used quite a lot um, by the name of Victorine Meuron. Um and uh, one of his favourite models. So you see her popping up. Uh, I do like that expression. Yes. On her face. Yeah. Quizzical, maybe. I don't know. What do you think? If you're saying about the future and how you sort of what's coming next, the child, even though you can't see her face, you can tell she's excited. Yeah. Which all children would be. Something new, steam. I mean, I love a steam train. Yeah. Or don't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We've got the Bluebell Railway in the yeah. house. Actually, didn't we agree to have a little Christmas outing on the Bluebell Railway? Oh, lovely. I mean, I'm not sure I don't know. Remember, I don't remember that, but it's on tape now. <laughs> on tape. How old am I? <laughs> <laughs> Get the reel to reel out again. <laughs> These eight tracks never go out of fashion. <laughs> but at least now people have heard it. I'm really no, looking no. forward to that. We're going to do a Christmas trip on the There Blue is Bell a Santa Railway. special, isn't there? Yeah. How exciting. I know. He comes down with mince pies. I love the Bluebell Railway. To decide whether we're taking the kids or not. Well, you know what I mean? I think we're best. Um, We've gone off pace again. I mean, she's got her back to that world. Mm. Again, I think that's deliberate. Right. And she's 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 looking at us. And basically, she, I, I, I read into that. And, you know, I can't get inside Manet's head. But I read into that. There's a, there's a kind of a questioning. Yes. You know, she's a, she's a nanny. Mm. You know, what, what, what's, what's her future? Mm. You know, does she have to wait, you know, if she loses her job as a nanny, then mm. what? Mm. Yeah. And, you know, there's other women that Manet paints. Um, the uh, Folie Bergère, no, Bar at the Folie Bergère. That's the bar one. So yes, the, you, see, I like that painting. <laughs> so the court, that's an amazing painting. That woman that's working behind the bar. Mm. You know, you could. It's very clear from her face that this is not her ideal work. And mm. but I mean, how many op, how many work opportunities were there for young women? Um, so I, I think there's I think there's a sense of you know what what what's lying ahead. She's she's I think she's quizzing the viewer. Yeah, and I always think it's worth bearing in mind with paintings that there are three elements to it. You've got so you've got the artist. And as I've argued many times, I think in a way, the more you know about the artist and their history, actually, the more the paintings can speak to you. Then you have the characters in the paintings. Yeah. But the third element, which you can never forget, is the person looking at the painting. <laughs> so you and I will, well, you and I will look at it differently, but compared to somebody in the 60s or the 40s or compared to somebody at the time, it's always going to have a slightly different interpretation, just as this painting in the gallery. Yeah. I mean, where you stand to look at it, whether any day, you know, the amount of daylight that's peeking, poking in, peeking into the, I mean, it changes. You know, there's always a slightly different reality, slightly different way of interpreting it. Oh, but by doing these podcasts, I have definitely changed because... I think even right from the beginning, I said to you, I didn't really, yes, I think they put them down as an art lover, <laughs> which still makes me laugh. Because I was like, oh, yeah. But I have to know now, I have to go into an art gallery and pick up on a few paintings that I know I'm going to see and actually look a yeah. bit more at the history before I start looking at the painting. Because otherwise I'm just going to wander past. So easy to do that. Mm. I went to, um, so I've just been to uh, Cologne. I love your life, Phil. <laughs> and um, Washington, Cologne. Where yeah. we, um, well, I just, you know, well, I, could, I hate to say, but we just won a very prestigious award for our Afghan film. Oh, that's so exciting. And uh, wow, pass, in today. <laughs> passing through Cologne on the way to Valladolid in Spain, where we uh, just won a very prestigious award for my childhood in my country. Anyway. So exciting. But in in actual fact, yeah. But in Cologne, I, and I've been there a dozen times, but um, the festival invited me and then they kept me very, very busy with talks and interviews and all the rest of it. But there was like a two hour break. So I went to the gallery, uh. actually Cologne's art gallery. 
Oh, called the Valdraff, I think it is. Right. Oh, that's right. Apologies <laughs> if it's not. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> Laura, it was unbelievable. Oh. It was absolutely fantastic. And I had so many artworks um, going right back to the medieval period and then up to you know this period and beyond. But it is, even I, I shouldn't say that even I, but it is very easy to kind of just wander past. Yeah, no, it's good that you say even I, because otherwise everyone's going to be like, no, oh, no, Phil no. would do that. No, 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 I'm and not. It's, it's, <laughs> oh, yeah, but no, it's very easy to just wander past. And mm. I had to, you go into a room full of medieval paintings of, of the Passion of Christ, <laughs> which is, a you know, I recently made a film about that subject, so I'm interested in it, but... yeah. Very easy just to kind of wander past, go, oh, yeah, another crucifixion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I found myself almost making myself like, I was like, okay, stop, look at this one, and really look at it. And actually, kind of imagine you were doing a podcast about it, or imagine you were writing something about it, mm, or, or yeah. filming it. What, what are the details? What's the story? Um, and in a way, by kind of focusing on a couple of pieces per room. Yes, I yes. possibly got more out of it than if I just kind of wandered through. Um, but well, my whole life has changed in the podcast for sure. But you used to go to galleries anyway. I did, but I mean, I had to. I think I can't make excuses for myself, but I mean, I had to. Maybe I was, the children were young, and you know, I was just like, well, let's get let's get them into the galleries. It's nice to see something, and even if you just see ten things, so I kind of was just busy. Wandering past, maybe I liked a bit more modern things. I never really looked at anything that you would have looked at, because I think we've said before. I think we just, just you know, went on a different path. Mm. And now, <laughs> well, actually, I kind of sometimes bore myself because I'm, like, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm so intrigued by everything. I do, I do think, <laughs> I, I do think with, um, it's a danger for all of us, isn't it, that mm. we we. We think we know what we like very early. Mm. It wasn't until I did Easter in art. I mean, do you know that, what did, what did somebody say to me? 40%. Anyway, some very high percentage of all the paintings in London's National Gallery mm. are paintings about religion. Right. Somebody say 40%. Anyway, very high percentage. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have any, if you think oh, I'm not interested in that and you don't look at those paintings, that's almost half the gallery you're not looking at. Yeah, yeah. So when I did Easter in Art and I started looking at those last seven, eight, nine days of this man called Jesus, it's his life. Mm. Even if you don't believe in the resurrection, so let's just assume, take for granted that this man existed and he was crucified. Just the way in which that's been reflected in art through the hist through through the history. I mean, it is the history of art yes. because basically every painter's dealt with it in one way or another. Um, and so some of the greatest artists in history, Rembrandt, Velázquez. I mean, you name it, Zurbaran, Goya, <laughs> um, Dali. Dali's crucifixion is amazing. He's looking at it from the top, looking down. Right. And then um, we were saying about Mantegna the other day, weren't we? But that then one. also, yeah, Mantegna, yeah, but also um, it's not only about that. It's also about the relationship between the mother and child. I mean, with Raphael, I mean, trying, trying to capture in paint the, dual, the duality of a mother of being overjoyed at the birth of a child and heartbroken because she knows he's going to die on the cross. Yeah. Mm. Trying to capture that in paint. I yes, mean, yeah. Um, Really extraordinarily difficult. Yes. Um, so, but of course, it's also, as I said, the history of art. And if you're an artist and you're given the chance of painting a man, you know, with basically an almost naked human body, so you can really go to town on musculature and all the rest of it, being put onto a cross, being taken off a cross, but all that whole kind of, all that biology, all that human emotion. Yeah. I mean, that was really, and, and usually they're quite big because they're altarpieces, so they've got to be seen. I mean, these are the best commissions you could get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with the Impressionists, I think some people might find them, you know, that phrase, chocolate box, you know, this is just, oh, it's just a pretty girl in a dress, you know, move on. Actually, this is, this is historically so interesting. Did any of the Impressionists do? I mean, so I'm asking you a bit of a weird question here. Did any of them do uh, Christ on the Cross? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
And how, also, how are, which one, do you know which ones? Or am I, have I gone over the top now? Because I was just wondering, what, what were their depictions like of those? Are they, because like when you look at this Manet, the child's arm hasn't got as much detail as you would imagine. Well, I suppose she's a child. So no, but they, been... don't, they, they don't, I mean, you know, you look at, you imagine the amount of time Leonardo would spend on a shoulder. Mm. I mean, you would feel it was completely, you'd feel the, the tendons and the ligaments under the skin. Yeah. You don't feel that here. And no. yet, and yet, if you look closely, mm. that's not just one kind of brush stroke of light pink. No. Actually, you look really closely. It is yeah. actually quite extraordinary. Yes, no, you're right. Actually. It is It is a mass of different colours reflecting. Now I've got it really close. It's actually beautifully done, yes. I think. Yes, and her hand especially is really pink. The hand is, yeah, mm. perhaps slightly re less realistic. Well, from um, a distance, it's perfect. But it being from a distance, and these are always meant to be seen from, a, again, that's why you've got to think about who's looking at the painting and where they're standing. Um, so... You, know, you stand a distance away where this this whole thing comes into focus. You don't question it. No. Um, I also love that kind of balance between, I mean, the Impressionists, is, I mean, they're so attuned to colour and colour theory and balance. And, you know, it is not an accident that the nanny is wearing blue with white trim and white buttons. Yes. And the girl is wearing white with a blue. Yeah whatever that's called, the thing on the back. It's well, kind of like a reverse bow. Well, it's, a, <laughs> I don't know, it's a big bow. It's a bow, but with, with something, yes. something hanging down, isn't it? Yeah, that dress would, I mean, it's a, if they were wearing any other colour, it would look completely wrong, wouldn't it? Yeah, imagine if that was yellow. Yes, no. Mm. In fact, that's always the thing to do, is imagine it was different. So imagine, <laughs> actually, even imagine if she didn't have her arm up like that, mm. then there's no kind of circularity there, is there? She'd actually feel a bit separate from the... That's what you could do, a little quiz, couldn't you? Get some paintings and put some yeah. odd bits in and then see, I mean, so many people from your Facebook page on your would know the difference, <laughs> especially after little competitions that you've been putting up. Um, you know, not trying to name the piece of paintings and things like that you're doing. It's really good. I always think that's actually very interesting. If you, just looking at this painting, mm. so imagine it without the railings. Mm. That would feel odd. Yeah. It would feel completely different. Mm. Imagine if she didn't have a book, so just had her, her hands clasped yes. together. She'd feel much less relaxed. She'd feel much, she'd be much tenser, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the, the, I think that the hair down, I think Manny just probably liked painting long hair, but again, it would feel less relaxed if, if you know, she didn't have her hair down like that. But the child's hair is up. Child's and yet, hair is if up. If her hair was down, it would look. It's amazing, actually. So her, her, <laughs> so her hair up suggests again. I think that kind of, for me, that makes it feel a little bit more bourgeois in a way. Mm. You know, the mothers or the nanny saying, you know, you can't go out to play no. until we've put your hair up and in a bow mm. and you're in your best dress. Mm. And it's not exactly what you'd imagine for playing in the garden. No, or with a puppy. But holding yeah. on to that railing, mm. very clever because it suggests that she's, you know, she's almost wanting to touch that world and she's enthralled. And imagine she was standing there with her arms by her side. Yeah. It would feel very static, mm. very one dimensional. Mm. And then, of course, not showing the train is brilliant. Mm. You don't need to. The yeah. train is, you see, now I know, actually, it wouldn't matter because trains can go either direction, but the, the station is to the left of this mm. painting. Oh, yeah, because you were saying you were filming by the doors. Yeah, looking, so, uh, looking, looking towards because where... Because I read somewhere, didn't I? I think I told you this anyway, that Manet, or someone's written that Manet, they were his studio doors. No. But you know that for a fact, then, well, because you were right there. Well, OK. His studio door does look like that. OK. So he might have put his studio door into the picture. OK. Even though in reality, as I understand it, from mm. having been there... Mm. Where this house is, the studio is actually to the right of this painting, oh, okay. up, up the street a little bit. Oh, I was going to say, so mm. he he decided to do something quite radical. He decided to show his own paintings right. in his own flat. Okay. 
Now, Manet was actually relatively well off compared to some of the others. So he had a decently sized flat. And he did, this is really, it's not the first time. I mean, Rembrandt um, in Amsterdam would, you know, have people around to his house. He had a big house and, uh, well, for a while anyway, and people would come to buy his works of art. So yeah. he'd have like a little studio in his house. But what Manet did uh, was he kind of had an exhibition in his apartment to so people who have to queue up outside the main door and be let in, to walk around his salon. Love it. His, his, his lounge. Yeah. Um, so like this living room that we're sitting in now, it's like if I had 20 paintings up on the walls and people would come and wander around. And that was quite unusual. Now, to some extent, it also is indicative of him being slightly apart from the Impressionists who a year later have a show in Nadar's photographic studio, but again, they got a big, there's a biggest, there's a big enough space within that building where they can show their paintings. I think it was on the first floor, but they did it together. Right. Manet's kind of struck out on his own. Now, again, I've shot that front door and I've shot the exterior of that building, and it does look like that. So he might have just put it in there as a little nod, um, but. Unless I've got this completely wrong, um, I don't think I have because no. there are no houses that have gardens onto the railroad on that other side of the road. Anyway. And if you are wrong, I'm sure someone's going to tell us, which is good. And it informs us. So Manet's flat then, it was a little bit further along. So he which is, this didn't is a look over the gar- He didn't look over the railway, but obviously was no. fully aware of it coming right through. Really, really close to where he was. Yeah, he couldn't see the railroad, mm. to the best of my knowledge. Don't see how he could have done it. It's a, it's a good 10, 12 buildings up, and the yeah. road is going off at an angle from the railroad. He'd have heard it. Okay. But he'd also have heard horses and carts and people shouting their wares, and, I mean, it would have been you know, noisy. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, it just, you know, the noise of the city was changing. Yeah. Railroads and construction and you know it's, it's it, this is a you know and, and impressionists are reacting to that some are seeking some are quite conservative and don't really like it very much and then prefer to be prefer to do landscapes and yes um and some really embrace it we made a film about the american impressionists where it's really clear that these artists are using this broad style that we call impressionism to tell a story about them and their world i.e the united states and some were really enthralled by the modernization that was going on and some really weren't comfortable with the amount of immigration and what it was meaning and and just you know some of them that was reflected by getting out of the city oh, okay, okay. Mm-hmm. and again they had the same thing the development of the railroad meant the development of suburbs and mm. and uh People could commute, and I mean, you know, railroads change everything. Um, yes, I do. So it's a, it's a really, yeah. it's a really so, interesting, and I, you know, I'd never, I know now, but I think the first time I saw this, I didn't even really notice those grapes. So that's you know, no, so that's quite. I didn't notice them till the end. I find that quite only because I do all what you say now. But yeah, what a fascinating painting. Yeah, really nice. And painting. there's yeah, so much to it. And Manet, Manet's life is really, I mean, good place to start. Exhibition on screen, film yes. about Manet. Yes. Because not only did we film the exhibition at the National, sorry, at the Royal Academy in London, but we do a full biography of his life and um, really such an important uh, painter. Okay. So there we go. Film. Manet's The Railway. Yes. Lovely. See you soon. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.